In this video, we're going to run through a mathematical proof that the square root of 2 is an irrational number, which means that it's a number that can't be written as a fraction in which the numerators and denominators are both whole numbers. Now that in turn means that if you try to write it out in decimal format, you'd have to go on working out decimal places forever. But more of that in a minute. First, let's talk about some ancient Greek philosophers, Pythagoras and Hippasus. I should think that pretty well all of you will have heard of Pythagoras because of the Pythagorean theorem, or Pythagoras' theorem as some people call it. It states that in a right angled triangle, the square of the length of the longest side is equal to the sum of the squares of the lengths of the shorter sides. You might know this better as a squared plus b squared equals c squared, and it seems pretty easy because we learn about it quite early in our school careers, but it was a big deal back in Pythagoras' day, about two and a half thousand years ago. There's general agreement though that the Pythagorean theorem wasn't written by Pythagoras, even if it did become one of his best known greatest hits. Now there are lots of stories, myths and legends floating around about Pythagoras, and whatever you say about him, someone else will probably say something different. The problem is that none of his writings have survived the passage of time, and many of the things that were written about him by other people are contradictory. He seems to have been a bit of a controversial figure. He called himself a philosopher, a lover of wisdom, and he started a movement of followers called the Pythagoreans. They were very secretive, and there were many references to their beliefs in the mystical powers and purity of numbers. One of Pythagoras' followers was called Hippasus, although it isn't entirely clear whether he followed Pythagoras himself or whether he was simply a follower of the Pythagorean movement, and maybe he wasn't even born during Pythagoras' lifetime. But anyway, from ancient artwork and drawings that survive, it does seem likely that one thing they had in common was that they both had beards, as beards were very fashionable at the time, and few people will contradict this. OK, to bring this rambling tale to a point of focus, there's a story that Hippasus managed to develop a proof that some numbers are irrational, which really upsettingly contradicted the Pythagorean beliefs in the divine nature of numbers. The reports that Hippasus drowned at sea a short while later. Some people say he just picked a very bad time indeed to reveal the truth of irrational numbers to his Pythagorean friends while out at sea on a ship, and they acted swiftly to cover it up. But this doesn't quite hold water, so to speak, because if it was true, how would we know about it? Now, Hippasus apparently showed how constructing a dodecahedron inside a sphere leads to the need for irrational numbers. But an easier method would have been to use a right-angled isosceles triangle with two sides having a length of one unit, and then the Pythagorean theorem to show that, in this case, the length of the longer side will be equal to the square root of two units. So we know that the need for a simple situation involving the square root of 2 arises. How can we now show that this is an irrational number? Well first, let's just make sure we know what rational and irrational numbers are. A half can be called the ratio of 1 to 2. It consists of a fraction with a whole number or integer on the numerator, 1 in this case, and another whole number or integer on the denominator, 2 in this case. That's basically all a rational number is, a fraction with integers on the top and the bottom. Remember, if the numerator and denominator both have a common factor, then we can simplify the fraction by dividing both by the same factor and getting an equivalent fraction. For example, 2 over 4 is a rational number, but we can divide the top and bottom by numbers by 2 to get the equivalent fraction, a half. A half is a simpler form of 2 quarters, and it's also a rational number. Now, we can take any integer we like as the numerator and any other integer we like as the denominator to make a rational number. Now let's take a look at a couple of rational numbers, one third and two thirds. Is there another rational number in between them in value? Well, one and a half thirds doesn't really count because one and a half isn't an integer. But an equivalent fraction to one third is two sixths, just double the numerator and denominator. And an equivalent fraction to two thirds is four sixths, again, just double the numerator and denominator. So instead of one third and two thirds, we've got two sixths and four sixths. And it sort of leaps off the page that 3 6 would be between them. And we could simplify that to a half by dividing the numerator and denominator by 3. Now we can apply this technique to any two rational numbers to find another rational number between them. And we can go on forever getting smaller and smaller differences. So it begins to look like you ought to be able to make any number rational. So what's an irrational number then? Well, it's a number that we can't represent exactly by a fraction with integers as numerators and denominators. 
For example, we use the Pythagorean theorem to show how there's a value called the square root of two. Now let's play around with the concept a little bit to see if we can prove that you can't find a pair of integers for numerators and denominators to represent that value. Let's start by assuming, in fact, that the square root of two is rational and that there are two integers, let's call them a and b, that we can use as the numerator and denominator to represent that value. So we've got the square root of two is equal to a over b, where a and b are integers and b is not equal to zero because something divided by zero is undefined. Let's also choose to pick a and b so that they represent the fully simplified fraction version of root two. Obviously, there'll be a family of equivalent fractions, 2a over 2b, 3a over 3b, and so on, but we're choosing a and b to make the fully simplified fraction version so that they don't have any common factors. Now, there's another implication of this. If a is an even number, then b must be odd, and if b is an even number, then a must be odd. If they were both even, then they'd both be multiples of 2, and 2 would be a common factor, so we'd be able to cancel and simplify the fraction. But we chose a and b carefully so that they didn't have any common factors. OK, so we've got the square root of 2 is equal to a over b. Now let's square both sides of the equation. And that gives us 2 is equal to a squared over b squared. Now I can multiply both sides of my equation by b squared so that the b squareds cancel on the right, which gives us that 2b squared is equal to a squared. Now over on the left hand side, b remember is an integer. So b times b, b squared, that's an integer times an integer, that must also be an integer. So the left hand side is 2 times a whole number, and a whole number, which is a multiple of 2, is an even number. Now over on the right hand side we've got a, an integer, times itself, so we've got a whole number times a whole number. And the only way that you can get an even result when you multiply two whole numbers together is if one of those whole numbers was even. And since we're actually talking about a times itself, then a must be an even number. OK, let's run through that logic in a little bit more detail. We can say that an even number is just a whole number multiple of 2. So let's pick a letter to represent any whole number, let's say m, then we can say that 2m is an even number. You tell me the even number you want and I'll pick a suitable value for m to generate that even number. It will just be half the value of the even number you want. You want 8, I pick m equals 4. So 2m is the even number 8 in this case. 2m is just an expression representing a number that we know must be even. Now we can represent another even number by assigning the letter n to represent another whole number, and then 2n must be another even number. Now let's multiply our two even numbers together, 2m times 2n, and because multiplication is associative we can write that as 2 times m times 2 times n. And since 2m and n are all whole numbers, we know that m times 2 times n will also be a whole number. And that means that 2 times m times 2 times n is 2 times a whole number, which must be an even number. So if we multiply any two even numbers together, we definitely get a result that's even. Now, odds and evens alternate throughout the whole numbers. 1 is odd, 2 is even, 3 is odd, 4 is even, 5 is odd, 6 is even, and so on, forever. And that means that because 2m is an even number, then 2m plus 1 must be the next odd number after it. Likewise, 2n is an even number, so 2n plus 1 must be the next odd number. So let's look at other combinations of multiplying odd and even numbers together to see if we can get an even number result. For example, if we wanted to multiply an even number by an odd number, we could do 2m times 2n plus 1. And again, because of associativity, we can write that as 2 times m times 2 times n plus 1. And again, we've got integers inside the parentheses there, so we've got 2 times an integer. So even times odd also gives us an even number. And that works the other way around too. If we had an odd number times an even number, we'd also get an even number. Lastly then, let's try multiplying an odd number by an odd number. Then multiplying each term in the first parentheses by each term in the second parentheses gives us 2m times 2n plus 2m times 1 plus 1 times 2n plus 1 times 1, which simplifies to 4mn plus 2m plus 2n plus 1. And if we factor out a 2 from these first three terms here, we get 2 times 2mn plus m plus n, all plus 1. Now 2 m and n are all integers and we're multiplying and adding those together so the contents of those parentheses there are going to be an integer. This gives us 2 times an integer which is an even number. So the result is going to be an even number plus 1 which is an odd number. 
And that means if I multiply any two odd numbers together, then the result is another odd number. So back to our problem, we had 2b squared equals a squared. Now we said that the left hand side, because b is an integer, must be an even number. And the right hand side is equal to a squared, which is something times itself. So we're either dealing with an even number times an even number or an odd number times an odd number. Now the only way we can get an even result is if a was even. So this is definitely true. Right, remember that I said if you want a specific even number, I can halve it and express your even number as two times half of that number. Well, let's do the same thing for the even number a. Let's call half of a c. That means that c is equal to a half of a. In other words, 2c is equal to a. And we can replace a with 2c in our equation, which means that 2b squared is equal to 2c all squared. Remember, 2c all squared means 2c times 2c, so we now know that 2b squared is equal to 4c squared. Now I can divide both sides by 2 to cancel off the 2s here, and I get 2 and 1 over here. In other words, b squared is equal to 2 times c squared. Then over on the right hand side we said c is an integer, so c squared, an integer times an integer, is also an integer, and this expression here, 2 times an integer, must give us an even result. Then using the same logic we used over here to prove that a must be even, we can say that b must also be even. But wait a minute, we said right near the beginning that if a is an even number then b must be odd, and if b is an even number then a must be odd. Now we've just shown that a must be even and b must be even. This is a contradiction. We've shown that b must be both odd and even at the same time. This must mean that our original assumption was wrong. We assumed that there are two integers, a and b, that can be used as the numerator and denominator in a fraction in its simplest form, representing the value of the square root of 2. But that assumption leads us to two mutually exclusive conclusions. That is, b is an even number and b is an odd number. So the assumption must have been wrong. There aren't two integers, a and b, that can be used as a numerator and denominator in a fraction in its simplest form, representing the value of the square root of 2. We call this sort of proof, proof by contradiction. Rather than proving something is true in all cases, we prove that assuming it's true leads us to a nonsense situation, so it can't be true. It's a pretty powerful technique. Now, irrational numbers have been known about for a very long time, and people don't tend to get as upset as the Pythagoreans did when they find out about them these days. But if you're going to show this proof of the irrationality of the square root of 2 to anyone, maybe it might be as well to make sure you're on dry land when you do it, just in case. When you subscribe to our channel, remember to click the bell to ensure you get notifications about our new videos. And for more mathematics content, why not follow the link in the description below to nagwa.com.